Our first session today is about a topic that's very important to our whole community. Dr. Pamela Tucker is joining us to discuss the pathology of rhabdomyolysis, risk factors and activities to avoid, as well as a gradual return to activity guideline to assist patients recovering from this condition. Following her undergraduate studies at Duke University, Pamela Tucker obtained her Doctor of Physical Therapy degree from Franklin Pierce University. Her clinical experience includes the management of outpatient and inpatient rehabilitation of infant, pediatric, and adult populations. She is Senior Physical Therapist at SUNY Upstate Medical University with specialties in pediatric, neurological, vestibular, and concussion interventions. Her research interests include physical therapy interventions for children with inherited metabolic disorders, aquatic physical therapy, concussion management, and robotic assisted mobility training. Dr. Tucker is currently working on a physical therapy protocol for recovering from rhabdo. Thank you, Dr. Tucker, for your willingness to work with our community in this unchartered territory. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction and thank you so much for having me here this morning. I know it's early, so I appreciate you coming down and listening to what I've been working on. The danger button is very tempting. So as was mentioned, I am currently working at Upstate Medical University up in Syracuse, New York. I'm a senior level physical therapist there. Current research that I've been working on are, I have two articles currently submitted for publication for return to PE after concussion and how to facilitate that activity. I'm also working on a case study on a four-year-old who had a stroke using a high-intensity gait training protocol. Some exciting news is a year from now, I'm going to try to bug Dr. Vockley down in Pittsburgh. My husband is in his last year of residency and has accepted a fellowship position. Yeah. <laughs> so diving straight into it and talking about rhabdo, first we have to clear out some things that may present kind of similarly, but are actually a little different. Has anyone ever experienced something called the DOMS or delayed onset muscle soreness? Yeah or hyper-CKemia. So these two conditions, they have some overlap in terms of how they present clinically and symptomatically. Hyper-CKemia, usually you'll see elevated CK, uh, CK levels after some sort of exercise. Now this can be normal. All of us will have some elevation in our CK levels post-exercise, but this is a little on the higher end. DOMS, is after exercise, that kind of soreness that you get that is in the muscles that you worked, it may have some elevation of CK, but it's not to the level of rhabdo. And the big difference is in the state of the muscles. So if when you're at rest, you're not having any pain, it's most likely DOMS. If you're having constant pain that seems to be getting worse, I'm more suspicious that it's rhabdo. I do throw out the caveat that if you are concerned about it, if your symptoms seem to be getting worse, definitely go get it checked out. This next slide is for those people who were kind and said they had experienced DOMS like I have, so I thought it would give you a giggle. One of the big questions I get asked is about strength training and how sore you should feel. I have a lot of athletes who come in and say, I actually work until I feel sore. I want to feel the DOMS because that tells me that I'm making progress. And the truth is a little more complicated than that. If you are experiencing soreness every single time after you exercise, you're doing too much. Occasional mild soreness that gets better after a few days, yeah, we're probably giving you an adequate challenge and you're probably working on making strength gains. Once you're at this level, no, we need to rethink the type, the intensity, your form with those exercises you're doing. So how do we build strength? 
On the side, you'll see a cross section of a muscle going all the way down to the myofibril, which is that smallest unit. Think of muscles like twisted ropes. They're these bands of protein that are wrapped around each other, and then they're sheathed in these um, myofascial layers that help conduct the electricity and build everything together to make this nice strong unit to let us move our bodies and go about life. The smallest picture there on the right, that's the sarcomere. So what happens when I want to pick up this bottle of water is a signal starts in my brain, goes down to my biceps here, fires an action potential, releases acetylcholine, triggers a change in the chemical balance across the cell, and lets these funky looking things on the lower right corner move and bind and connect to each other. So these are actin and myosin. What happens is the myosin heads, they kind of look like golf clubs. They reach forward and they grab onto the actin and they pull. That brings this whole unit here on the right together, kind of squishing like an accordion. All muscles pull, none of them push. Kind of funny how we have exercises called push-ups. And all um, muscles have a muscle that usually undoes what that first muscle does. So picking up this bottle of water, my biceps turned on to put it down, triceps lowered it. So we're gonna have a little fun right now. And I'd like you guys to, if you have water or if you have anything in front of you, can you lift it up with me? Try to keep your arm nice and close to your side. So this action of bringing things closer to you, of bending your elbow, this is a concentric movement of your muscle. So the muscle's shortening and bringing this bone here in your forearm closer to your shoulder. When you lower it down, if you focus on going nice and slow, you can feel that tension in your muscle. That's an eccentric movement, so it's a, a controlled lengthening of your muscle. The next one I'd like to talk about is if you take your hand and put it under the table or put it on the surface of the table and just push without tipping it over on your, your neighbors, please. You can feel the tension in your muscle, but you're not moving. You're not moving your body through space. That's an isometric movement. So these are actually really important and they're good to know because rhabdo is more frequently triggered by eccentric movements than any other exercise. So on the right here, you can see some other examples of concentric versus eccentric movements. So an eccentric movement would be like lowering down into a squat would be eccentric work on my quads, just like that lowering of the water bottle is eccentric on my biceps. We went into the signs and symptoms of rhabdo the other day, so I won't go too far into this. You guys all know about the the pain, the muscle swelling that you might see, the tea-colored urine. So those are all things to look out for. One thing that I do try to tell any of my patients is you want to monitor your performance throughout exercise. You don't want to push past injury. And this is something that I've seen much more frequently with the increase in exercise program, programs like Peloton, CrossFit, Ninja Warrior, all that kind of high-intensity competitive movement because it's just drilled into us from our friends that we're there with or the trainer who's telling us, come on, you can do it. You can do one more rep. Listen to your body. If you're trying to do pull-ups and all of a sudden you can't clear that bar, it's time to rest. Don't have them come over and, okay, we're going to do assisted pull-ups at this point. No, this is pushing into injury and you're going to have a more prolonged recovery and not see the gains that you're actually pursuing. This chart I think was reviewed the other day, but this is the tea colored urine that you're on the lookout for. Good hydration is over there on the left side. You're looking for it to be mostly clear and maybe a slight yellow color. And this next slide has some of the causes and triggers of rhabdo. So as you know, patients with FAODs are predisposed to experience rhabdo, and it might occur after some of the events that are listed on the left, like illness, exercise, fasting, fatigue. 
So now into the, the fun things and what you guys are all here for today. What currently exists in the literature? So the protocol I'd like to present with, to you today is the result of a very large literature search. It's a little embarrassing, but it's it was thousands of articles. We'll just say that. I've picked a few of the ones that I think were most relevant to show where we started and where I'd like to lead us and where I think we need to go in the future. There are more that I haven't listed here. So if you guys have any questions about it, just let me know. So back in the 90s, there were these military PTs that had 10 soldiers come in after doing hundreds of up-down push-ups. Has anyone ever heard of or ever done up-downs? If you haven't, that song over there on the bottom left, Bring Sally Up, look it up on TikTok or, or YouTube, it'll be your new least favorite song in the world. <laughs> so these soldiers presented with rhabdo in their arms. It wasn't anything too medically complicated. So the PTs developed this program for them that's four steps. I'm gonna see if I have a laser. Oh. Oh, here we go. So you can see the first phase, they were emphasizing just the mobility in the muscles. So active range is me moving my arm on my own against gravity. Passive would be them moving it for me and stretching it through. Once I broke it. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Once they regained their range of motion, they transitioned into the beginning of an aerobic exercise program that started at five minutes, and it gradually progressed in duration and intensity until they could maintain it for 15 minutes without any onset of pain or any other symptoms. After that, they switched over to strength training. So they did free weights and also body weight exercises, and their emphasis was on push-ups because it's the military and they love push-ups for whatever reason that I will never understand. Once they completed that phase, they were cleared to return to doing push-ups with a cap on the number that they could do each day and gradually transition back into basic training. Does anyone, well, what are your thoughts? Does anyone have any feelings one way or the other about this protocol, like it, hate it, see any problems? Yes. Yes, that was my big problem with it too. And I will say that I don't see push-ups as a very functional exercise because so much of our, our day and our daily activities is pulling. We really don't push that often. So focusing on just this specific exercise, I was like, I don't think this is as functional as we'd like it to be. So we're jumping ahead now into 2003. So this patient presented to PT. He was also a soldier in the military. Um, he went straight to PT. Military PT is a little different than civilian and they're able to do things like order labs, order imaging. So all of his management was run through the military physical therapy department. He was a little more complicated and they monitored his CK levels. They actually admitted him for a brief period of time. He also did hundreds of push-ups, And this is what he looked like on his first day where he couldn't raise his arms above about 90 degrees, was having pain and swelling, and also had tea colored urine. These therapists used that same protocol that Randall used in the 90s, but they added in this push-up training method. And the thing that I liked about this is that now we're actually seeing some better data on what does strength training look like? Because if you remember the previous slide, they just said, oh, we worked on body weight exercises. We had them lift some free weights and they did modified push-ups. Here they actually calculated, okay, what was their max push-up before they got sick? Let's start them at 50%, have them do a set number of reps and monitor their form and the intensity, then progress to the next stage, then progress to the next before we clear them for return to duty.
So by this point, the military is noticing they have a little bit of a problem. They are giving a lot of guys rhabdo. This led to CHAMP, which was a multi-nation project that was headed by the US military and Israeli forces. It was led by Dr. Francis O'Connor. And together they developed this guideline, which is the most medical one thus far, guiding return to activity post rapto Here you can see the first phase is emphasizing rest, oral hydration, you're monitoring CK levels. Once you're under five times the upper limit or the upper limit of normal for CK and your urinalysis is clear, then you're considered a good candidate for starting to return to activity. Phase two, they recommend light activities, nothing strenuous. You're completing it at your own pace and distance. You're doing this for one week. And if you have no symptoms, you can move on to phase three, which says gradual return to sports and physical training and you follow up as needed. Does anyone have any thoughts or feelings on this one? Yes. That was exactly my problem too. And because I'm not exactly a shy person, I called him up. <laughs> and funnily enough, he is a former SU grad and he saw that, um, that I was working there and he said, I'm actually coming up to Syracuse to visit. When do you wanna meet? So we put our heads together and in all honesty, he said that he relies in the military so much on the PTs to guide return to activity because that's what our focus and our training is on. And I was telling him some of the things that I had in mind for the protocol that I'm going to show you guys. And he was like, honestly, like the medical side is the biggest thing that I can recommend at the start and to monitor throughout after that go for it. So he was a very nice guy and he was very helpful. Uh, he's the head of the military school up in Bethesda, Maryland. And like I said, he directs the CHAMP program. He did have some very interesting research that is fresh off the press that I'm excited to share with you guys. So because of this problem that they're seeing with rhabdo and its incidence increasing, he delved into the role of the leader and the follower in terms of, of experiencing rhabdo. So what that turns out to be is the different roles we take, like coach and athlete, parent, student, um, military, drill sergeant, recruit, and how that affects our performance and how we push through different exercises. He came up with this, this picture that he asked that I share with you guys talking about how important it is that we keep communication open between the leader and the follower, that we monitor ourselves and we know our limits, we know what our goals are, what our past fitness is, and we share that with whoever the leader is and that they also reflect. They know their biases, they know what they're looking for and the goals of the different exercises they're doing. So I'll give you, for, uh, for instance, if you're working with a soccer coach and they're just having every single person do sprinting drills and it, it doesn't change at all, it's just that one exercise and they're not open to adapting or mixing it up or breaking up the exercise with different breaks or intervals, consider finding someone else because that role, that relationship is so important. The study that Dr. O'Connor was doing found that in relationships where that communication wasn't open and where biases weren't acknowledged and addressed, the incidence of rhabdo was skyrocketing. So that's really hard, especially when we have little ones. And that's where parents can really step in and just try to advocate. You guys are so amazing at advocating for your kids. Just presenting to the coach or to the PE teacher, whoever it may be, this is what's going on. This is the exercises that they've been doing. This is what they're hoping to do. These are things you need to be aware of 
to make sure we're all having a good time and it's all successful. So moving out of the military, we're gonna take a look at football. In 2016, there were some division one football athletes who experienced rhabdo and being the NFL, they had all the funds and support in the world to throw at this. So they had a team of athletic trainers and physical therapists develop this protocol that you see here. So this has four different phases for return that then are broken down into sub phases. This first phase just focuses on returning to your activities of daily living. So that's things like cooking for yourself, cleaning, dressing yourself, laundry, going to school, going to work, just those typical things. After that, they start doing some different exercises. And the interesting thing with this protocol is they started by putting these athletes in the pool. And they found that the athletes that they got in the pool had significant improvements in their pain, the swelling in their muscles and their joints, and their overall mobility. They recovered faster and more efficiently. Phase three, they're starting to do more body weight and land-based exercises. Phase four, you're doing more a progressive resistance training program and more agility running those kinds of exercises. So here is a closer look at phase two and what they had these athletes do. So they had them doing foam rolling across their body and doing these different exercises in the pool, starting about chest deep, gradually working to shallower waters. Next up with the resistance training, they did a pretty intense training program involving walking with bands, doing lunges, doing deadlifts, Russian twists. All of this was directed and supervised by the athletic trainers or the PTs throughout. They did have them doing initially steady state cycling, which is just this one continuous exercise. You have the same intensity. You don't really take breaks. That then progressed to doing intervals of hills and flat surfaces to gradually more and more challenge. Finally, in the last phase, they transitioned into more of that high level agility and running exercise. Starting with some untimed runs, then switching into box jumps, box runs, ladder movements. And you can see they started a little lower on their intensity for resistance training than that earlier protocol. They started around 20, 25% of the one rep max, which if you don't know what that is, it's just the maximum that you can lift or press for one repetition, and then you calculate it from then from that. So say for instance, my one rep max is 100 pounds, then I would calculate, okay, my one rep max 20% will be 20. So that protocol is probably the most in depth. What do you guys think of that one? Yes, so I really like all the detail in this protocol that they came up with. The barrier that I saw with it is it's the NFL. They had a lot of money, a lot of time that they could throw at this. They had people monitoring these guys day and night, making sure their, their blood levels were good, their CK was good, their hydration was okay, their sleep was sufficient. Not all of us have that, unfortunately. So. And I also felt that it was a little complicated for your general person to get back to exercise. I liked the diversity of their exercises, but my goal was to make something that either could be shared with 
families and shared with like coaches or athletic staff or shared with a PT and then it could be directed together and you don't have to look at four different tables to figure out what, what phase you're at and what you're doing. The last bit of research that I want to draw your attention to before I show you my proposed protocol is this consensus that was reached by physical therapists and other uh, sports medicine clinicians. So this came out in 2016, and this talks about return to sport and what that means. So something that we need to keep in mind before we get sick is what level am I at and what do I want to reach? Okay, now I've gotten sick. Has that changed? They divided return to activity into three different stages. The first is return to participation. So just getting back to maybe being able to do your regular activities, maybe being able to do some sport, but it's not at the level that you were at before you were sick. The second is your return to sport, but maybe you're not performing at quite the level that you want to, but this could be the final step for some people. Not all of us are going to be Olympic athletes, so being realistic about the expectations that we set is important before, before any injury, before injury and attempting to recover. The last is return to performance where you're at or above your previous injury level. So this leads out of recovery from rhabdo and this is more leading into strength and agility, training, balance, conditioning exercises to help you excel as an athlete at whatever you're trying to do. The authors of this also talked about communication and collaboration of the big stakeholders in return to sport. So that's coaches, families, parents, the athlete, schools, and figuring out what the target is, what the finish line is, while also keeping in mind that the road to recovery is never this beautiful straight line. I really wish it was, but usually it looks a little more like this where things start to look better. Okay, I'm having a rough day. Okay, things are looking better again. Okay, that was really tough. And now I now I need to take a break for a bit. So next up, this is the protocol that I've been working on for the last year. And I would like to just put out there that I really consider this to be a living document. I haven't gotten to use it on any patients with FAODs yet. I've used a modified version of it with a young female patient that I had who had chemo-induced rhabdo, and she's been doing well with it, but it hasn't been tested beyond that. So I accept any and all questions or feedback. My eventual goal for it, like I said, is I hope to make a document that can be shared in a medical binder say you're admitted and you have rhabdo and you say, this is where I'm at. This is what I want to start working on. Even starting in the ED, I feel that um, referrals to PT uh, for this specifically in the ED can help facilitate recovery, just get you up and going faster. And it's absolutely within your right to request that you be seen by a PT before you are discharged. I've worked in the ED and I've seen some, some patients with rhabdo, um, we don't get offended by it at all. And usually we try to make it pretty quick and painless. Can't promise that it's 100% painless, but we'll at least crack bad jokes. So there's a lot of information on this slide. This is the first stage. So you've just presented with rhabdo. Maybe you've been admitted to the hospital. So similar to that protocol that Dr. O'Connor promoted, I'm looking that you have this period of rest, you hydrate and you're monitored for your labs. So you're looking for your CK levels to be declining, your urinalysis to be normal. However, I do also want to start focusing on your pain management and your range of motion. So this would be, okay, you're admitted, but while they're doing IVs and doing everything that they need to, okay, now PT can come in and start showing you how do you do some nice gentle stretching. How do you do active and passive range of motion in whatever limb or 
ab like abdominal muscle, wherever you were affected. Here, you're progressing to the next stage once your labs are within normal limits and once you have pain-free range of motion. Once again, I'm sorry, I know it's an overwhelming slide, but here you're discharged. You seem to be getting better, but you're still having pain and symptoms. So you're starting some aerobic and strength exercises. My preference is that you start with isometric exercises. So the exercise I had you do before where you pressed into the table and your muscle engaged, but it didn't move anything. You're starting there and at a very low intensity, just around 20%. So it's just enough that you feel it turn on for a few seconds and then turn off. The goal of this stage <clears throat> is to increase your tolerance for exercise. You're starting to do some modified interval training to add in rest breaks between your exercises that progress over the stage. You can transition to the next stage once you're able to do low intensity, so like two to three on a modified Borg scale, and I'll show you the Borg scale towards the end. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. So at this stage, I actually don't recommend massage. And I would say tread with caution with some of the massage tools that are out there, like Theraguns and Graston tools, uh, Gua Sha tools, things like that. Uh, there have been some case studies of patients who have either induced rhabdo or exacerbated their rhabdo with those tools. Stage three, we're starting to do a little more strength training. We're up to 50% of the estimated one rep max. And I acknowledge that not everyone will know their one rep max before being sick. So this is where you can see a physical therapist or you can maybe see an athletic trainer and they can give you some suggestions on how to do different exercises. Um, what I generally tell people, if you're not able to estimate your one rep max, is see if you can do 10 reps of an exercise. If numbers eight, nine, and 10 are challenging for you to do, that's probably somewhere around your 70% of your one rep max. Throughout all of this, we're monitoring for any alteration in your form, your technique, we're monitoring for pain. Phase four, we're starting to get into a little more sports activities. You're looking to start doing a few things during gym class. You're adding some different training drills and you're adding more of a cognitive challenge. So what that would be would be like passing drills. So I have to dribble down to the, the line and I have to pass left, then I have to move to a certain spot because that adds a little more energy demand, a little more balance and coordination demand on your body. Here, towards the end of the stage, you're going up to 70 to 90% of your heart rate max, which if you don't know how to calculate that, you take 220 and you subtract your age. I'm seeing nods, so I feel like everyone kind of knows that formula. Okay. Next up in stage five, we're looking to do some circuit training. So you're looking to target the same body area, but with more exercises. So before we were just doing one targeted exercise to one targeted area and then moving on. Now you're adding a little more demand, a little more diversity in your exercise. In gym, you're starting to do maybe some small group games, some ball handling exercises, any skill work that's re relevant to the curriculum. You can also start going into more of a HIT training program with burpees, squat thrusts, ex exercises like that. Stage six is the last stage before returning to sport. So this is a pretty high level stage where you're looking to do pretty high level um, resistance training. You might notice that as we've gone through this program, the numbers of reps and sets have changed. 
So early on, our target is to build the endurance of the muscle, make sure that you have a good foundation that stabilizes you while you're doing different exercises. Then as you're getting into stages three and four, it's more about building strength. And this here where you see you're just doing six reps, maybe, of this exercise, this is all about performance. So these are those high powered movements that we need to do like long jumps. So it's a quick explosive exercise, then you let yourself recover before trying again. Stage seven, you're returning to your sports activities. My estimate for this, I didn't want to put in set days and weeks for the timeline because everyone's different and it would be arrogant of me to assume that I know exactly how all of you perform physically without having ever met you or measured you at all. So I'm looking more to monitor your form, how you're feeling during the exercises. And once you meet those benchmarks, then you can move forward. But tentatively, I tell patients that have rhabdo, I expect full recovery and return to performance around a year. Around three months, you're probably back to activity and sports but this may vary a little. It takes time. I do have an aquatic component because I love the pool and I feel like it's really great for a lot of different patients, but specifically for this condition, like the uh, PTs and athletic trainers found for those division one athletes, it can really help with your mobility. It offloads you. One of the great things about the water is that it takes out that eccentric component of exercise. So remember how earlier I said, this is a concentric movement, this is eccentric. In the water, you get resistance in all planes. So it's a good whole body strengthening without that increased risk of damage that eccentric movements can pose. You can push things like running and agility exercises a little quicker in the water because of the cushioning aspect. So the other important thing to go into is reducing risk of rhabdo. So a lot of the case studies that I was reading and a lot of just the research that's out there, it talks about even high level fitness athletes, they can experience rhabdo. And the thing that leads to this injury is they'll perform an unaccustomed exercise or they'll perform it too intensely or they'll perform it with, too, with improper form. On the other side, you'll see patients who try to go couch to marathon, and that's just not great for our bodies. We need to ease into things, take it little by little, add, make small changes as we go. Over on the left, you'll see what guides my clinical reasoning in terms of exercise prescription. So I follow recommendations from the American College of Sports Medicine and also basic principles of training, talking about how I guide the intensity, the timing, the type of exercise, and the frequency. As I mentioned before, these tools over here, so at the bottom right, these are Graston, Gua Sha, Soft Tip Tissue Mobilization Tools. They have a couple different names. So these can be really great. These are yellow flag, tread with caution. Um, I tell patients, you never want to really crank on one specific area. You want to give yourself breaks. You can use it to, like if I have a knot in this muscle here, okay, maybe use it a few times here, move in circles, do brushing strokes. You never want to dig into your muscles. Same thing with these um, Theraguns. There were a few case studies of patients who had given themselves rhabdo through excessive use of the Theragun. It can be a great tool. It's a use it wisely situation. This chart here has very general exercise recommendations, breaking down into the different types of exercises that we typically do, including aerobic, resistance, flexibility, and balance exercises. So you'll notice nothing is every single day of the week. You do want to give your body time to recover, as I mentioned, when you build strength, you're putting load and challenge on your muscles. So it leads to a couple of different things. 
strength is built through improved engagement of the muscle fibers from the brain and also from hypertrophy of those muscles. So that sarcomere unit that I pointed out before, it gets bigger. How that happens is there's some damage to it and in the cellular repair process, it strengthens and we get more layers of protein so it's more efficient. That can't happen if you're trying to say, I'm gonna do 100 push-ups every single day for five weeks. I've seen a few challenges like that and that's just too much strain on your body. Building in rest days, let you recover and perform ultimately better. So these are the principles that I use to guide how I prescribe exercise. Things to keep in mind are how often are you going to do an exercise? How intense is it? What type is it? Is it an eccentric exercise or a concentric one? Am I doing isometric? Am I doing stabilization? And then how long am I doing it? This can provide some nice general guidelines on how to progress exercise and activity. So you can take the foundation laid out by that previous chart and consider things like, okay, I'm starting a biking program and I want to ultimately do a triathlon. I'm just adding in those that first week or so, maybe five minutes on the bike. I'm not looking to make big jumps. A triathlon is a big goal to work towards, so it's going to take me some time to build up to there. For resistance training, I always recommend that you increase the number of reps before you increase the load. So that would mean, okay, I'm starting at trying to do eight push-ups before I start doing like decline push-ups or doing um, weighted push-ups. Let's see if I can work my way up to 12. This is an exertion scale that I use with my patients. So you have the original version over here and then the modified one here. So this might seem a little familiar from last year. The first few phases of my proposed protocol, you're aiming for that kind of somewhat easy light activity zone. So there you feel like you're maybe doing something, but your breathing isn't really increased. Your heart rate maybe increased slightly, but nothing like some of these lower levels where you're starting to notice, okay, I'm breathing a little heavier and my heart rate's increasing and you're staying away from these nine and 10 zones. I almost never recommend that patients train at these levels because you're really not getting the bang for the buck that you want. At the most, I usually aim for level eight or so. Okay, hopefully I haven't put you guys to sleep because I do have a few exercises for you guys. So breaking up those different types of exercises, I have a few that you can take with you just as things that you can implement through your day. They're good for just about everyone and they've got good ways to progress and regress them. So let's get up and move a little. Thank you. 
Try to come all the way up on your toes and then down for more of a stretch on your heels.
Do we have time for a question or two? I know I ran probably a little late. Yes. I would say a balance of both. Unless you're really pursuing a high level athletic training of like you're only going to be a power lifter. And really the evidence says stay away from training for one specific sport. Diversity is your answer. You want to have flexibility and power, conditioning and balance. Thank you all again.